You can ask my wife for confirmation on this, and I think that she'll readily agree. I'm a bit of a nut sometimes when it comes to the exactness of words. I like the right word to be used at the right time. I I like it to be used in the right context. And I'll tell you, I'm my own harshest critic. I go back and listen to some of the things I've recorded before and go, oh, that's not the right word. I, I I should have said that differently there. One of the things that gets jumbled up sometimes that, that uh, kind of is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine is the words imply and infer. Imply is something that I'm doing as the speaker. I, I'm trying to get a, a point across. So I'm implying something that I'm trying to to get to you. You, on the other hand, as the listener, are inferring something from my words. Kind of think of it this way. Imply is like throw and infer is like catch. But there's a problem that comes in sometimes when people infer something, when they try to catch something that was never thrown their way. I will hear people frequently say, well, I looked through the Gospels, and since Jesus never addressed blank, then therefore it must be okay. Now, in logic circles, this would be called an argument from ignorance. They're simply saying, well, since nothing was said about it, then we can come up with whatever conclusion we want from that. Instead of asking, is this what you mean? They are just going to infer that that is what was said. Now, I bring that up because we've been going through this series called, Is That in the Bible? And we're taking phrases and saying, okay, we've heard this phrase a lot. Is it actually in the Bible? And if so, Are we applying it in our lives the right way? Are we using that phrase in the context that the Scripture would ask us to use it? So here's the phrase that I want to ask you today. This is our 10th phrase that we're looking at, is this phrase in the Bible, love your neighbor. Yes, that is in the Bible. In fact, here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. He says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor. Jesus is almost doing kind of like what our series is doing. He's saying, is this in the Bible, love your neighbor? Now, Jesus would have called Scripture everything that you and I today call the Old Testament. The 39 books from Genesis through Malachi, that is what Jesus and anybody living in his day would have said was Scripture. So here's what Jesus is really saying. Is this in the Bible? Is this in Scripture to love your neighbor? And it is. It's recorded for us in the book of Leviticus, where God himself is speaking, and he says this, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but, and here's the phrase, love your neighbor as yourself. And God says the motivation for this is to remember that he is Lord. He's the one who's saying it, so we need to pay attention to it. So, yes, it is there in the Bible. Later on, Jesus is going to answer a question that uh, some experts in the law, some lawyers, came to him and said, you know, Jesus, we Jews have a lot of laws. And if you were to boil it down, what do you think is the most important of the laws? And Jesus takes not only this passage from Leviticus 19, but one from Deuteronomy chapter 6, and he puts them together, and he says, I'd answer this way. The most important commandment at all of all is this one from Deuteronomy chapter 6, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And then he says, you know, and the second one that really is kind of 1A is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we have come to refer to this as the great commandment. It's not called that in the Bible, but the great commandment. And this lawyer that asked the question, even I think he pondered that for a second and said, you know, that's a good answer, Jesus, because I can't think of any commandment at all that we would break if we were saying, am I loving God with doing this and am I loving my neighbor with doing this? You know, I frequently uh, will refer back to my grandfather's Bible. I, I have it I have it right here. Um, he passed away in 1984, and I was blessed to have his Bible handed to me. I, I don't know how long he had used this before his death, but I frequently will page through here and look at passages of Scripture that I'm going to talk about and see if there was anything that he highlighted, uh, anything that he underlined, and it just kind of helps me keep his memory alive. 
But I found a handwritten note from him next to Jesus talking about this. And you can see in his note, he's asking the question, what is the worst sin? And his answer is really breaking something in this great commandment. He says, breaking the greatest commandment, which is love the Lord God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So I think we're safe in saying yes to this one that is that phrase, love your neighbor in the Bible. But there's another part that Jesus says. So he's really asking, is this in the Bible? Because you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. See, the Jewish leaders, the rabbis, they did this inference. They inferred something that wasn't there. In fact, the the great Bible commentator, Matthew Henry, made this observation. They were willing to infer what God never designed. In other words, here's what they did. Jesus said, when, when he quotes this, if we go to the Old Testament, the Hebrew language, that word for love is kind of what you would think of as love, just doing kind things and good things for other people, having positive feelings towards them. But the word that is used in the Hebrew for neighbor means somebody that has at least some kind of a connection to you. And so the logic, the thinking of the rabbis kind of went something along the lines like this. Well, we're supposed to love our neighbor. And a neighbor is somebody who's in community with us. So therefore, a neighbor is a Jew. So we're supposed to love fellow Jews. Anything other than a Jew would not be a neighbor. So therefore, they would be an enemy. And the opposite of love is hate. So we can hate our enemies. So statement number 11, then we have to ask, is this in the Bible, hate your enemies? Well, we're going to say yes but, and then I'm going to quickly add no. You see, Jesus is asking that question as well. He says, this is what you've heard. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But in the very next verse, he says, but. He says, that's what you've heard. So you've heard the scripture from Leviticus chapter 19. And now you've heard the rabbis for so long that have said, here's our logic. Here's kind of what we're, what we're thinking here is that a neighbor has to be a fellow Jew. And if somebody is not a fellow Jew, then they're not a neighbor. Then therefore they're an enemy and the opposite of love is hate. So it's okay for us to put both of those together. They inferred something that God never said that God never implied. And so then Jesus has this word here, but I'm going to tell you something different. You see, in a lot of ways, the Old Testament laws were easier to live out than the New Testament laws because the Old Testament laws were all external. And so they were very easy to measure to say, yes, you did it or no, you didn't. So Jesus even addresses a couple of them here in this same Sermon on the Mount where he's talking. He's saying, you know, don't commit murder and don't commit adultery. And so it was easy for the Jewish people to say, well, I've never gotten into bed with somebody who's not my spouse, therefore I haven't committed adultery. And yet Jesus made it a heart issue. He said, yes, physically you may never have gotten into bed with somebody who wasn't your spouse, but if you've lusted after somebody, a heart issue that's not your spouse, you have committed adultery with them. Somebody could say, I've never murdered somebody. I never took their life. But Jesus said, but I'm going to make it a heart issue. If you're so angry at somebody, if you hate somebody, you have murdered them. It's the same thing as sticking the knife into their back and taking their life. So Jesus says, look at, I want to spin this around. I want you to see it in the proper context, not inferring something that wasn't said by God, but listening to what was truly said. So he he says this, but I tell you, love your enemies. Now, remember I told you in the Hebrew that that word for love was that just kind of broad sense, that feeling of, well, you know, I like you and you seem to like me. And so it's, I like doing things for you because I'm going to get something back from this. But Jesus uses a Greek word here for love, 
but takes it to a totally different place. Again, makes it more of a heart issue. He uses the word agape. It's the same word that shows up in that well-known verse, John chapter 3, verse 16, when he says, for God so loved, God so agape the world, the world that was at an, a place of being an enemy of God. They were unrighteous. They were rebels against his love. They didn't want to follow God's ways. But look what he said, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. See, the agape love doesn't wait to see, are you worthy of love? Is this going to be something that I'm, I'm going to get something out of this when, when I do something loving for you? But it just simply says, I'm going to love you because God loves you. And so that gives you worth. The word that he uses here for enemies, when he says, but I tell you, love your enemies, the word that he uses here, the Greek word ekthros, is one that is an outright rebel. Paul uses that word of us before we had a relationship with God through Jesus. He says this in Romans chapter 5, for since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, while we were still ekthros, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. He's going back to what Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 16. When we weren't worthy of his love, that's when he came. We were his enemies. And Jesus said, I want you to love the same way, but I tell you, love your enemies. But let's go back to this. This is in the Bible. It says also for us to love our neighbor. And it says for us to really consider our enemies as our neighbors. Now that same attorney, that same lawyer that asked Jesus, can you can you tell us the great commandment? Remember and Jesus puts together those two verses. He he gives them the, that verse from Deuteronomy, love God, and that verse from Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. And when this lawyer hears this, like I told you, he says, "Boy, Jesus, that is a good answer." But listen in Luke's gospel. Listen what Luke says here. He says, "But this guy," he says in verse uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 29, he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, so what exactly do you mean by neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells a very well-known story. We call it today the story of the Good Samaritan. He says there was a Jewish man. He was on a journey, and he was mugged, he was robbed, he was left naked and bleeding and dying on the side of the road. And there were two fellow Jews, Jews that if they were truly going to follow what the scripture said in Leviticus 19, love your neighbor, this would have been a neighbor because he was a fellow Jew. But they said, and Jesus said both of them were religious leaders, they said, I just can't be bothered. I don't have the time. I don't want to get my hands dirty. This isn't my mess. Somebody else can deal with this. Whatever thoughts went through their head, they passed by without doing anything. And then a third man came by, somebody who was not a fellow Jew, somebody who was a Samaritan. And Jesus, I think, chose a Samaritan on purpose. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They would go out of their way to avoid going to any city that the Samaritans were in. Frequently, if they said the word Samaritan, they would spit on the ground after they said it. Just They didn't even want the syllables of the name Samaritan in their mouth after they said it. And yet it's the Samaritan who stops. Now he stops to help a man who every morning prayed a prayer that said in part of his prayer, God, I thank you that you didn't make me a Gentile. You didn't make me a Samaritan, a, a, somebody who wasn't a Jew. And that's the man who stops, got his hands dirty, inconvenienced himself on his journey to pick up this man, to bandage his wounds, to put him on his own transportation, to take him to an inn, a safe place, and not only pay the bills for that had already been 
racked up, but to leave in essence a promissory note and saying, when I come back, if there's more expenditures to make this man well, I will make good on that bill at that time. And Jesus asks a question of that lawyer. He says, now of those three men, which one was the neighbor? And notice that this attorney can't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. He just simply asks the question by saying, the one who had mercy, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said, yes, you should go and live that same way. See, Jesus says, is this in the Bible? Love your neighbor. Yes, that's in the Bible. And then he says, is this in the Bible? Hate your enemy. No, it's not in the Bible. The exact opposite is there. Love your enemy. And who's your enemy? People that you should make your neighbor. Now, in John, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, I'm reading it out of the New International Version of the Bible, and there's an asterisk here that if I go down to the footnote, it says that in later manuscripts that there was more to this verse. So in other words, somebody added something to this verse. Now, I'm always a little cautious then. I don't want to uh, make a theology out of something that, that a scribe or somebody put in later that uh, appears to not be in earlier manuscripts. But in this case, I think we're safe in using the full verse that some Bible translations still have, because not only are are they solid things, but they're things that Jesus demonstrated in his own life, in the way that he responded to the enemies of God. So let's look at, out of, at it out of the New King James Version so we can see all of the parts that are there. So Jesus says, have you heard this before? Love your en enemies, or love your neighbor? Yes, that's in the Bible. Hate your enemies? You've probably heard people infer that incorrectly, but here's what I'm going to tell you instead. But I say to you, Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So Jesus is really saying there's going to be an unexpected response, but I tell you. I want you to respond in a way that's unexpected, a way that nobody would have ever imagined that you were going to respond. I want you to respond with love. And that loving response is really in three parts. The first thing that he says is bless those people who curse you. Now, I unfortunately, you probably know what it is. I certainly know what it is to say that somebody cursed you out. And what happens when they do that? They open their mouth and vile words, hurtful words, ugly words come out of their mouth directed at you or directed at me. That's what it means when we say that somebody's cursing. They're vile words that, that come out. And Jesus says in response to that, I want you to bless the people that curse you. Well, what does that mean? Does it just mean simply to hear those words and say, well, God bless you? Well, maybe that's a start. But the word that Jesus uses here for bless it's a compound word. It's eulogio. That prefix you at the beginning means good, but logio is words. So what Jesus says, when somebody curses you out, when they say bad words to you, you say good words to them. Friends, that listen, that also means you say good words about them when they're not around. Remember, Jesus made this a heart issue. So don't just go through the motions of saying something nice to them, saying good words to them when they're there. And then once you get alone with your friends, say, you know what that so-and-so said to me? And you know what I'd like to see happen to him? You're being a hypocrite. But say in response to their bad words, unexpected, your unexpected response of loving that enemy is to say good words to them and to say good, good words about them. The second thing that Jesus says is when they hate you, you help them. Do good to those who hate you. When, when, when you see them s throwing hate at you, you find some way to be able to help them. 
This is how, uh, remember how Jesus said here the word but, and he says, you know, I want the, your response to be something completely unexpected. Paul said the same thing in Romans chapter 12. He says, don't try to get even with people. When they do hateful things to you, don't try to get even with you. And he uses a similar word instead of but, he says, instead. But listen to his unexpected response that really resonates with what Jesus says. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, Give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their head. They'll, they'll feel ashamed of their hateful response to you. And then I love this conclusion. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. You know what Paul is really saying here? And I think Jesus, his, his lifestyle demonstrates this as well, is that he's looking for an opportunity to do good things. He's saying, okay, this person is lashing out in hate. How can I help them? What kind of pain do they feel in their life that they are lashing out this way, and how can I help them? See, Jesus goes on to say in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, as he goes on, he says, listen, God even lets it rain and lets the sun shine, even on the people that are unrighteous, even on the people that are hating. He's going to still continue to give them good things, and that's what he's telling us, and that's what Paul's saying in this verse as well, that when people hate us, we help them. We are proactively looking for ways. We're seeking ways to help them. Okay, So when they curse us, we bless them. When they hate us, we help them. And then the third thing here is when they persecute us, we pray for them. It's an unexpected response. We are doing things the complete opposite of what they would expect because we are counting these enemies as our neighbors, and we're going to love our neighbors by blessing them, by helping them, and by praying for them. Listen to the whole words of Jesus here so we have this in context. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies, but I tell you. Now listen to those words again, that, that full uh, statement from uh, New King James Version. He says, but I tell you, I want you to, to help them, bless them, help them, pray for them, do all of those things. And then he says, why? that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? In other words, there's a reward for doing this, but you're not going to get it if you're only loving those people who are kind and affectionate towards you already. Because he goes on to say, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers... What are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. And here's the clincher for me. Verse 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Just like God responded this way, you were my enemies, so I loved you and sent my son. We're going to respond the same way. We're not going to count people as enemies, but when they start to respond to us by cursing us, by trying to do harm to us, by persecuting us. We're going to say, I'm going to make you my neighbor. I'm going to consider you as my neighbor, and I'm going to respond in a way that you never expected. Here's how I'm going to love you. I'm going to say good words to you and about you. I'm going to find ways to help you, and I'm going to pray for you. Now, this is going to require, friends, from you and I, really, I think, three things. The first one is we have to have the right attitude. We have to have the right attitude about these enemies of the cross. Look what Paul said. For I told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes. That's the response. That's the attitude we need to have. Tears. For who? That there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. We need to have our hearts broken towards people that are responding this way. The second thing is, friends, you and I need to be dressed the right way every, every day. Again, look what the Apostle Paul tells us. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Remember, it's a heart attitude. That's what Jesus was teaching us. So I need to get my heart in the right place. I need to clothe my heart that way. I have to have the right attitude towards them. But ultimately, friends, what we're going to do 
is we're going to pray that our blessing, that our helping, and that our prayers for them are ultimately going to result in them recognizing Jesus as their Savior themselves. Here's how Peter said it. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Friends, listen, think about it this way. What if you and I lived such perfect lives as Christians, as Jesus said here, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. We are so striving to live out what Jesus said that enemies would say this, you know what? I need a blessing in my life, so I'm going to curse one of these Christians because I know that their response back to me is going to be blessing. What if these enemies of the cross were so in need of help that they said, I'm going to hate them, I'm going to throw harm their way because I know their response is going to be to do good back to me? What if they were so in need of prayer that they said, I'm going to persecute you because I know that when I do, you're going to pray for me? What if our love for them was so unexpected, the way that we blessed them, the way that we helped them, the way that we prayed for them, that it would begin to completely change their attitude and they would recognize that they as well are in need of a Savior. So friends, let me sum it up for you this way. When the world hits Christians out of hate, let's respond with this completely unexpected love. We're going to bless them, we're going to help them, and we're going to pray for them. When we do that, God is glorified. We're going to get a reward out of it, and I believe we're going to completely turn the mindset around of people who are enemies of the cross, and they're going to embrace the cross. They're going to embrace the Savior who died on that cross, and they truly will become not just neighbors, they're going to become brothers and sisters in the family of God alongside of us. Friends, you can do it. God's going to help you do it. The Holy Spirit is going to help you have that right attitude that you can respond in love. God bless you, friends.